As rising sea levels endanger the Pacific Islands, how much longer until the impact is felt worldwide? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. A report from the World Meteorological Organization revealed that in 2023, the Southwest Pacific region experienced 34 reported extreme weather events that caused 200 deaths and impacted more than 25 million people. In August, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres spoke at the 53rd Pacific Islands Forum in Tonga, and he had this to say. The world must look to the Pacific and listen to science. <laughs> This is a crazy situation. Rising seas are a crisis entirely of humanity's making. A crisis that will soon swell to an almost unimaginable scale with no lifeboat to take us back to safety. But if we save the Pacific, we also save ourselves. The world must act and enter the SOS before it's too late. With global sea levels rising at rates unprecedented in 3,000 years, what actions will nations take to combat the effects of the climate crisis? To discuss this and more, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Arizona, Mohamed Mahmoud is a water management and climate adaptation expert. Andrea Simonelli is an associate professor of political science at Virginia Commonwealth University. That's in Richmond in Virginia. From Shanghai, Cheng Wu is chair of the governing council of the Asia Pacific Water Forum. And from Florida, we're joined by John Englander. He is president of the Rising Seas Institute and author of Moving to Higher Ground, Rising Sea Level and the Path Forward. Welcome to all of you. John, let me start with you. Good to see you. It's been some time. Uh, that report from the World Meteorological Organization says that not only are sea levels rising, but oceans are also warming and acid levels in oceans are also rising. And that's because of the absorption of carbon dioxide. Um, so what is your assessment? Put this into some kind of perspective for us. How serious is it? And it's good to be back with you. Unfortunately, the message really hasn't changed a whole lot, except that we are seeing accelerating uh, warming, uh, these, these heat spells all over the world, wildfires that go along with it, uh, heavier rainfalls. But the really serious long-term issue that we tend to overlook or underestimate or think there'll be some magic bullet solution is sea level rise, because sea level, as we've discussed before, in fact, has been fairly stable for 6,000 years, more or less human civilization. But we know from geologic history that sea level moves up and down meters, tens of meters, tens of feet. Um, sea level was 400 feet lower, uh, 120 meters, and uh, it's been 25 meters or 75 feet higher in the past. We are heading back to this unknown territory and those reports uh, articulated well the, the severity. We've had warnings since 19, the, eight, the late 1980s from eminent scientists like Dr. James Hansen and others. Now they say that their estimates were underestimated and we're seeing the effects. We have to wake up, we have to start planning just as Jakarta and other cities are recognizing that um, we have under, under planned for an emerging threat. Right, so John, when you say cities like Jakarta have recognized uh, that we've underplanned for this crisis, what are they doing? Well, they've, they've decided to relocate the capital. I mean, they're not going to, they, some people say they're going to move Jakarta. That's not accurate. The, the president uh, two or three years ago announced that because of the land sinking there, so they have much worse sea level rise because it's global sea level rise plus the sinking land, mm -hmm. which adds up to about three meters in the last uh, several decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with, with that kind of flooding factor that's really unique to Jakarta, mm -hmm. um, they're going to build a new capital city and you know bring most of the uh, uh, businesses with them and the government structures. But the, uh, the poor people who live in greater Jakarta, yeah. some 15 or 20 million people, um, there's no solution for how to um, relocate all of them. Mohamed Mahmoud, you know, as we heard the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres say in our introduction, the current ocean conditions are entirely of humanity's making. I mean, if we look at some of the islands in the South Pacific, islands like Tuvalu, Tonga, 
uh, New Zealand for that matter, uh, they're already seeing extreme weather conditions. They're seeing cyclones, they're seeing heat waves, uh, large uh, tracts of land have been destroyed, homes have been destroyed, and of course they're deepening concerns over things like food security, water security, the provision of health services, and health itself, the health of people. Um, so how do you see it? Is this going to get a lot worse? Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, the thing about sea level rise is, uh, you know, as John has sort of indicated, it tends to be viewed as a, a slower catastrophe, right? Where we tend to react better to extreme weather events that come fast, hit hard, and, and leave damage in its wake. Uh, but the thing with sea level rise, it's going to occur over the span of decades. And unless we bend the curve in terms of emissions affecting warming, it will continue unabated for centuries. That's what we learned from the IPCC six assessment cycle uh, was one of the takeaways. Um, the point you raise really is also interesting. We think of it as the end game of uh, the impact of all this, that islands will be completely inundated. But until, hopefully we avoid, but if that future comes to pass, there's a lot of misery that's gonna happen between now and then. Uh, just think about the slow inundation of land, the loss of coastal areas, residential areas, we just heard about what's happening in Jakarta, uh, loss of arable land if they're growing uh, food and crops, intrusion, saltwater intrusion if there's freshwater, groundwater sources. So it's gonna be a slow, slow uh, decline uh, and struggle uh, as this proceeds. And the double effect of that with extreme weather and things like cyclones is you're dealing with sea level rise encroaching incrementally, but if you have an adverse uh, extreme weather event like cyclones with flooding, intense uh, uh, rainfall, there is minimal protection now as you're losing land and that flooding is essentially accelerating uh, some of that potential damage that will come with sea level rise in time. Right, Mom, we're talking about sea level rise. I mean, it's just not going to affect uh, places in the South Pacific, islands in the South Pacific, it's also going to affect low-lying urban areas, cities on big continents. And I'm thinking of places like Miami in the United States or even New York. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We tend to focus on islands because absolutely they're the most vulnerable uh, in this regard. There is no room to move away from the inundation. But even continental areas where, where people can even move inland, there's massive coastal areas that are that will be lost, uh, as you rightly stated, in the continent and in the, in the Pacific and the Atlantic side of the United States other continents, anywhere where there is a coastline, regardless if it's an island or not, is under threat. And we see some places that try to counteract it, but I think, you know, they're trying to adapt to this issue as they're, as they're slowly seeing this impact. Like, for example, places like Bahrain itself, an island close to uh, the Arabian Peninsula. For years, they've started to reclaim land as a, as a form of expansion, not necessarily direct adaptation to, to sea level uh, rise and encroachment of, uh, of water. But even that is just delaying the inevitable. The real solution lies with trying to bend the curve in terms of emissions. So we reduce the warming that's right. occurring in the oceans that's helping to expand these, uh, uh, expand water into these coastlines. Right. Andrea Simonelli, great to have you with us. Welcome to the show. I mean, this is also affecting people's livelihoods, isn't it? And it's affecting culture and ultimately, uh, it's also affecting people's existence. I mean, economies uh, in these small island nations are facing unprecedented challenges right now. We look at major industries like tourism, like fishing, that's all being affected. It affects their source of food as well. Um, what do you believe can be done right now to mitigate what is going on? Well, driving down emissions is the number one thing we can do to start on, on the process of, of minimizing the impact as a, as a globe. But um, you know, in the meantime, You've got uh, some islands trying to, uh, like the other guest was saying, uh, in terms of reclamation, Tuvalu is, is raising its main island. Um, you already have some out migration release valves. Australia has offered a new uh, visa type for Tuvaluans to, I think, about three to 300 or 350 a year uh, in a lottery-ish to, to be able to start moving out. But the reality is, is a lot of people don't want to be going anywhere, and that's because they have culturally rich lives that they appreciate. So part of the biggest problem here is that we're seeing a huge loss in, in not only local livelihoods, you know, as seas warm and fish docks follow cooling waters, they may not be in the EEZs anymore, 
uh, and available to local small fishermen. So you're adjusting all of the, the local food stocks, whether it be to inundation of sea, uh, water into crops or where the fish go. And at the end of the day, you're looking at a lot of need to revamp entire economies who were otherwise fairly sustainable on their own prior to all of this. Right, Andrea, as you say, people don't want to go somewhere else. They don't want to go away from where they live, and that's totally understandable. So to what extent is this going to mean major adaptation to the dangers that are coming? It's going to be, it, I mean, major is probably the best way to put it. It would be major adaptation to be able to stay. And, and that's because with the slow encroachment of water, uh, even on a, a, a sunny day, uh, with king tides coming in, they're slowly getting larger and larger. And now if you add a, a rough seas plus that, you're getting that incremental problem. So seawalls are, are usually discussed, but it's only a, a Band-Aid on, on the long term, essentially. And of course, once you put that up in one place, it, 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 it changes where uh, the, um, the erosion is somewhere else. So even the, the basic ways of thinking about protections also come at a cost. And that's also with a dredging and adding more sand, it's expensive, it eventually gets pulled away too. So in some ways you're fighting a losing battle. Right, Chang Wu, uh, you know, much of the mitigation efforts that we're talking about, of course, it's gonna cost money. And there is one finance facility that is working to counter conditions in the South Pacific. The Pacific Resilience, uh, that's what it's called. It's described as a member owned and managed people-centered climate and disaster financing facility. They hope to raise half a billion dollars by 2026. China has also pledged to help, and of course China has been playing a major role in this battle against climate change. It was uh, played a pivotal role in driving the Paris Accords and was one of the major signatories to those accords. So how much of a role can China play to help the South Pacific Islanders? China definitely has an important role to play uh, in this contest, partly due to its climate obligations and also particularly looking at the accelerated growth of new emissions there. Uh, I'm delighted to see China has been uh, acting very proactively working with uh, through the South-South Climate Partnership, uh, particularly with the Pacific Island nations. Uh, on one side, of course, we need to uh, mitigate the climate change, but more and more importantly, we need to enhance the capability uh, and the capacity in the Pacific Island or small island nations there for resilience adaptation. Uh, the facility you mentioned, the Pacific uh, Resilience Facility, is the first of its kind uh, for the global community to explore uh, how to create a new mechanism to do so. And China has committed to contribute half a million U.S. dollars to that process, uh, working together with other developed countries and other major economies to support the island nations there. Uh, so I think not only the final financing side, but more importantly, from experience, uh, you know, what China has been doing, particularly along the coastal areas there, uh, we are talking about, you know, China has a long coastal lines and they've been suffering, you know, dramatically in terms of losses and damages uh, from uh, sea level rises and the surging storms there. So, uh, you know, the facility itself, not only on the financing side, but also on capability expertise, is a really good indication of a togetherness and collective action. So, talking about with those efforts that you talk about that China has made along its own coastline, what, what exactly has China been doing? Well, I live in Shanghai, so Shanghai has been uh, proven, regarded as one of the mo most vulnerable coastal regions, you know, against the backdrop of intensifying climate change issues there. And, uh, you know, the role model Shanghai has played is really to build up a massive uh, sea walls and uh, meters high in order to somehow help, you know, enhance the resilience capability there. Uh, but this is a probably sort of more responsive, uh, you know, action for now, uh, as the guests been, you know, fellow guests been talking about more urgently than ever. We also need to really mitigate climate change as fast as possible, particularly to phase out fossil fuels, because we know 85 percent of greenhouse gas emissions are from fossil fuels, and the large countries need to take on their obligations there. Uh, so China definitely has been gearing ahead to deliver its Paris Agreement uh, commitments, and uh, hopefully somehow we're going to see more ambitious targets made into the new international process.
Right, I want to talk about those targets. John Englander, um, the Pacific region, the South Pacific region, I should say, contributes 0.02% of global emissions, whereas G20 nations represent 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you know, we talked about the Paris Accords a moment ago, and of course there were pledges made by UN member states at that conference that took place in Paris. Um, you know, does it need a reality check right now? I guess it does. Where are we now insofar as meeting those goals and targets that were set by uh, nations at the Paris meeting? Um, failure might be uh, too strong a word, but uh, many, many think not. It's um, uh, here we are, um, what, nine years later and uh, 29 co conferences, annual meetings of what we're going to do. And we're still talking about what we're going to do and who's going to pay for it, which are relevant questions. But um, the problem gets worse every year. There's more heat stored in the ocean, trapped in by the carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. Uh, that science has been well known for 150 years. And uh, as you store more heat in the ocean, uh, that be, um, we're now at 1.2 degrees Celsius. Um, it's projected we are going to hit over 2 degrees. Obviously, more ice on land will melt. And as more ice on land melts, the sea level rises globally. In addition to every place that's been mentioned on this uh, program, mm. I mean, think about places like Vietnam or Bangladesh, I mean, countries which are just barely above sea level to start with, and with tens of millions of people uh, Mohammed, at risk. Uh, right, Mohammed, the rising sea levels, um, you know, as we as we've heard, they're impacting nations around the world. Uh, that report that we talked about at the beginning of the show, the WMO report, states that global mean sea level will continue to rise, and this is the alarming part, it will continue to rise over the 21st century um, and for centuries into millennia. I mean, that sounds really ominous, does it? Uh, I mean, what will we experience? Well, this was, I mean, the WMO, uh, I think, is also picking back, piggybacking off uh, of the outcomes of the six assessment report, which basically said that if we continue on the trajectory we're on in terms of not really mitigating emissions and, and addressing the warming issue and, 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 and uh, reducing the effect of warming on land and oceans, you're correct. This effect of sea level rise will continue unabated in for a number of centuries and millennia, as you stated. What's even more alarming, not, not to dig a deeper hole here, which is if somehow, magically, tomorrow, we completely cut emissions, we would not see a reversal of this trajectory of sea level rise still in the span of several centuries, meaning it would take several centuries for the trajectory of sea level rise to stop before it then begins to abate. So that doesn't really paint a really uh, positive picture in terms of uh, of the impact of sea level sea level rise going forward. But I think it also highlights the urgency of uh, reducing the emissions, address the warming. And of course, mm. as, as I've, I've usually been prone to say, as we're addressing the mitigation issue of, of uh, the emissions and warming, addressing emissions and warming, adaptation needs to occur. And in the case of sea level rise, if this is going to continue for centuries, adaptation needs to be in the forefront for people to be able to survive. And just one other point, Mohammed. you know, we talked earlier on about the fact that coastal uh, land will be lost to rising sea levels. I mean, could we actually lose large tracts of land? I mean, could we see coastlines change? Could we have to redraw, or will we have to redraw the map at some stage? Absolutely. I think that's that's inevitable. I mean, in, if you look at human history and sort of evolution of, uh, of land and geography, that has happened naturally, you know, post Ice Age and all that. This is happening in a, in a different manner. Um, so, yes, uh, you know, I've seen projections and mapping that looked at how uh, sea level rise would erode uh, certain coastlines, and it will drastically alter the map, especially if we consider, and these are just simulations and projections, we don't know for certain, but it, it, it paints the picture that if this truly does continue for centuries, the Earth will look significantly altered in terms of its uh, land mass and coastlines. Right. Andrea, let's talk about the, the politics of climate change. I mean, to what extent is geopolitics uh, and ideology getting in the way of meaningful change? I mean, if we just take the United States as an, as an example, I mean, um, we see the debate over climate change. It follows pretty much um, 
you know, the political fault lines in the country, uh, in the United States. Cons conservatives are very skeptical about climate change. Many of them don't believe that it's, it's something that is happening right now. And then we have, of course, the liberal side, which has been calling for change for some time right now. And they've been also calling for urgent action. So how does politics get in the way of this? It's been a huge barrier to getting uh, really uh, work done for emissions, to make uh, grand changes, and the U.S. being the uh, one of the largest emitters in the world to begin with, the fact that we can't make solid and, and more substantial progress is partly because of the political dynamic. And it feels almost odd, I think, um, that it falls this clearly because other science doesn't. You know, no one is, the, the right wing of America isn't suggesting that we should all walk off buildings because they don't believe in uh, gravity. But yet climate change is, is, you know, we know the science behind it is modeled through physics and physics is the same basic thing that at the end of the day, you know, physics has laws. We we follow them through the way that we model and, and we come out with projections based on what is already scientifically known. And and there's it's weird to watch the questioning of that. Mm. You're not seeing it on other topics. Yeah, we do hear conservatives say, Andrea, that, you know, um, these efforts to mitigate climate change. Uh, I mean, you hear many of them say that it's actually an effort by the rest of the world to clamp down on our economic growth. But, you know, how does one convince, um, I guess, those skeptics that it's not clamping down on economic growth? In fact, efforts to mitigate climate change also poses enormous economic opportunities. There are lots of opportunities, but the issue is going to be that it'll be a shift. And that shift may bring new economic opportunities to different locations than where currently certain geopolitical owners of, of resource bases already exist. But I think the biggest sort of pushback to that in terms of industry is, is not really thinking ahead on their own to say some of the largest companies couldn't already be making those changes because they have research and development budgets large enough to do so. But any sort of threat to the status quo of where money is coming in seems to be more of the issue. And I, I'm a little skeptical if it's if it's really skepticism if climate change is happening mm -hmm. or sort of a willful ignorance being very concerned about their own personal bottom lines. Right. Chung Wu, the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization Secretary General, Celeste Salo, she said, I'm going to quote her directly here. She said, the ocean has taken up more than 90% of the excess heat trapped by greenhouse gases and is undergoing changes which will be irreversible for centuries to come. Unquote. Of course, uh, this will impact the ability of the ocean, the capacity of the ocean to sustain and protect us. So what kind of a future would we be looking at? Uh, at this moment, it's not very promising, as we are discussing today. And uh, we are living in climate crisis, so that's why there is a strong sense of urgency. Uh, global community needs to come together, particularly leading economies, uh, to transform and to really quickly, dramatically shift away from fossil fuels and uh, bring down the emissions. But in the meantime, uh, major economies need to provide financial support mm -hmm. for vulnerable countries, nations. And we're talking about it here today, the Pacific Island nations and other small island nations there to help enhance their resilience. Now, I do want to bring back the, the, the conversation actually back to China. Compared to the U.S., climate change, fighting climate change sustainability is already a choice and decision made by China. Uh, so there, you do not see the politics interfering that much in terms of shifting you know, which pathway to follow. So there is a clear pathway selected by China already to shift. To, on one side, we do need to mitigate climate change. We need to you know, enhance our non-fossil fuel developments. Uh, in the meantime, of course, we need to enhance our capability resilience. But very, very importantly, we started to see policies like pricing, subsidy, regulation, information, disclosure coming together to really drive through the changes on the ground level, looking at the industrial facilities, uh, you know, emissions, different sectors there. So that's a very, mm -hmm. you know, sort of encouraging sign to see that China is really solid on it to lead the transformation globally. John, uh, COP29 is going to be happening in a few months. Uh, now, at COP28, the previous meeting, uh, Pacific nations were not very happy there. They felt that they were not given enough of a voice to make their concerns heard, especially on the issue of phasing out fossil fuels. So what, what do you expect from COP29? 
Well, I was not at COP28, um, so I can't speak firsthand, but um, based upon the report from people who were there, colleagues, uh, I guess you always want to have some optimism that there'll be an improvement, but I think based upon the lack of any clarity of a plan that, that uh, steps up to the challenge, as you've outlined in this program today, yeah. um, it's it's not very promising at all. Uh, mm -hmm. They're they're still arguing about um, who will fund, which is certainly a relevant question, right. but uh, it's standing in the way of doing. We need to do three things at once, let's be clear, as, as all of your speakers have agreed on this program, which is excellent. Uh, we need to slow the warming, and as much as we can do to get off fossil fuels, the better, the sooner the better, yes. But even if we did that perfectly, if we had some magic energy source tomorrow, yeah. we still have to deal with the um, excess flooding, extreme flooding, I should say, that's happening today. Storms, hurricanes, typhoons, um, heavy rainfall event, uh, deluge all yeah. over the world. We're seeing record floods, unprecedented. We have to design for the kinds of floods we could see in the next year right. or decade. And then as your panel has said, we need to start planning for the future because sea level will be, not if, will be meters higher. It's a question of whether we get one, two or three meters this century and that will accelerate into the next century as you've alluded to. So we have to do three things in, 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 um, in parallel. Uh, slow the warming as quickly as we can but regardless of our yeah. efforts to do that, work on uh, preparing for greater future floods. Yeah. And in the extreme case of as the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica melt, raising global sea level by meters, that's now unstoppable. So we have to be in preparing and planning and engineering differently for the future for our uh, kids and you know future generations, as well as our current economy. Mohammed, the UN uh, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, he was in Tonga recently, he talked about finance, you know, finance to, uh, to fight climate change. Um, I mean, one of the things he talked about was that much of the finance that's been pledged, that's been promised, has not been forthcoming. What are your thoughts on that? Has there been a bit of checkbook diplomacy going on here? Part of the issue with climate financing, a lot of it just hinges on year to year and uh, meeting to meeting. If we, let's say, we're focusing on the COP meetings. Last year, COP28, when I was there, there was a lot of financial pledgings and support and right. uh, sort of startup uh, funds created by the UAE, uh, and they're able to do that. Yeah. But part of the issue is, can other countries come to the table and yeah. meet their obligations? Certainly, we talked about developed countries right. need to take up their share in terms of their contribution. And so um, that's that's going to be an issue still. All right. Okay, Mohammed, I'm going to have to interrupt you there. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C. The nature of business is to bring value. Business activities in Europe, Asia, and the U.S. reach consumers globally. Trade, manufacturing, energy, high-tech, real estate, consumption. We give an expanded view on global business and how it covers, influences, or relates to the whole world. Global Business, only on CGTN.